official mama welcome i was just like scrolling tiktok you guys popped up on my fyp <laughs> no worries i actually invited you by accident and i was like oh there might be a reason that i did that on accident yeah we <laughs> are a nonprofit. Um, real quick, our name is Vets for Child Rescue. It's generally a group of veterans and supporters who are not okay with children being harmed. So our mission is to expose and eradicate child trafficking, specifically here in the USA. My biological mother, she traded me for drugs from when I was five until I was 11. I appreciate you being here. I, I know that you're here for a reason. I think those of us who have experienced one form of another of the type of abuse that we're talking about, we have a really in-depth understanding of how this works and what people need to be aware of, what we wish other people knew, we wish other people could have done to make a difference for us. We can't necessarily go back and change that past, but we can pay it forward and we can protect children today. We can arm people with the knowledge of what they need to know in order to safeguard children and be part of the solution. So you're definitely yeah. here for a reason, ma'am. I, <laughs> I, have, I have PTSD still, even though I'm, I'm 34. She also, she traded me to her, her brother and um, her stepdad as well um, as I got older. And so ultimately I ended up in foster care and I wasn't a kid that was like chosen, you know, but um I, I will definitely say that it does have its like lasting effects. I don't trust. So I was in an abusive relationship, but I don't trust my daughters around anybody. I've been single for almost 10 years and um, I don't trust my daughters around anybody at all. When I was going through what I was going through with um, my mom's drug dealer, um, he would tell me all the time, he'd be like, you know, it's either I trade you or your mom will give me your sister. And um, so I was the oldest of eight. So I would, I would willingly go with him, you know, because in my mind, I was like, it's better me than my sister. Oh, my gosh. I can't even tell you how many girls that they were there because their parents just left them. And yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's really... It's sad, it's unfortunate that there are parents who simply, for one reason or the other, neglect the child's needs, either cause them to be harmed themselves directly or indirectly just allow them to be vulnerable victims because they let them be taken advantage of. We were talking about this earlier, but it's never, ever the child's fault. It is never, ever, ever. You could not have done things better or differently. So first, I want to validate that it was evil. It was evil what happened to you. I'm not here to assess. I don't know all the details of your story, of course. I don't know all the people involved. I'm not saying every person involved was evil. I'm saying what happened, the act of abusing or harming a child, is evil. So understanding that and accepting that and acknowledging that is sometimes... Sometimes survivors just need acknowledgement that what you went through, I'm not going to question your memories or if it really happened or if it was really that bad. You know what I mean? Like what happened yeah. to you happened and it was bad and it was evil. And I'm not here to tell you to forgive or forget or to just get over it. No, ma'am. I am here to validate what you went through. I'm here to thank you for sharing your story because unfortunately a lot of people still think this stuff doesn't happen or they think it's a theory or they think we're blowing it out of proportion and being a little too extreme here. It's not that it's their fault that they're not aware. And I am very glad when someone has so little understanding of the situation because they didn't experience it. Like, good. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to compete with you with who has the worst trauma. I'm saying like, look, I understand that a lot of people don't understand this. We are here to educate them and raise awareness. There's this big part of it, though, is that ideally we would prevent every child from experiencing this in the future, right? I think I'm going to speak for myself, but I think most of us survivors would be okay with what happened to us if it meant that no other child had to deal with it. Exactly yeah. what you said about protecting your younger sibling. I think all of us are warrior enough 
that we would put ourselves in harm way to help another child avoid it. You were case in point of that as a child. That takes immense strength. I want to acknowledge you for that as well. As terrible it as is of what you went through, I'm so glad your sister had you. I'm so glad that you could have shielded your younger siblings from experiencing what you experienced. I have yeah. older siblings that did that for me and it literally changed my life. It literally caused a night and day difference in my upbringing versus theirs. It doesn't mean that I'm glad it happened to them. That means it had to be someone and how amazing, like how proud of yourself you should be that it was you. I wish you had had a parent that had done that for you. I wish you had had a strong adult come in and save you. But you know what? Things happen and it's sad that there are evil people in the world. It's sad that you weren't allowed to be a child and that you had to make those types of mature decisions in order to stand up for other children. But I also want this to be a lesson to all of us adults who are watching this now. If she could stand up to the bad guy and protect another child, even if it meant sacrificing her own safety, what is our excuse? I don't think people realize how common it is, to be honest, um, because I lived in San Antonio, Texas, and when I was in elementary, I was not the only girl. I can tell you right now, I was not the only girl. And these were other people's parents. Um, it happens more um, in poverty areas, mostly because of the fact um, my mom used to tell me that I was dispensable. And so um, that stuck with me throughout life. Um, but it is way more common um, than more people think. The reason I know is because I wasn't the only little girl that was at that house. I, I wasn't the only little girl. What people should realize is that predators prey on the vulnerable and they find and exploit vulnerabilities. So yes, it, specific, it happens disproportionately to children from lower income families, kids in the foster care, kids who are at risk. We just had CP on who was an example of that. They know when you're vulnerable because you're an easier target. So yes, culturally, to Forest Point, like let's back up, zoom out. Yes, culturally, there is a problem with the broken family where the parents are not there enough for the kids to actually safeguard them. So that's a big, you know, cultural issue that can take generations to correct though. So simultaneously, you have these children who don't have the support that they deserve or the families that they really can, that can really be there for them. And they do fall for these tactics it's called grooming. When a predator makes promises and tells you, you know, you're going to have this and that and a better life, or, you know, maybe it's from threats. Like if you don't do this, then X, Y, Z, or some, I'm going to hurt someone yeah. or whatever. So there's all these different tactics. A, a big thing that most people who haven't, you know, experienced this kind of thing can't relate. They don't understand how it can happen. Most of us can't compute the mind of an evil psycho person because we are not evil or psycho, hopefully, right? So there's understanding why a person would want to harm a child, but then there's some people who don't understand how a child can let that happen or how a victim can let that happen. When you spell it out to them, I think they're quickly embarrassed by how ignorant that train of thought is because it's a child that doesn't know better and who is getting taken advantage of. So like, if I really have to spell that out for someone, I'm happy to, but... No, it's not that the child decides to do this or wants to or decides to stay. It's really not a choice when you're talking about a child who has, first of all, been groomed, brainwashed, exploited, and a lot of other synonyms for those words, but also does not know better. It is not within the child's comprehension that they are being taken advantage of, so they don't assume that it's abuse. They don't know that. They may know that, for example, their mom's in trouble, and if I don't do this, she'll be sick, mad, whatever. Or if I don't do this, my younger sibling, like they may know that there are risks involved or that there's something that's not okay, but they don't understand what's going on ever. So point one, never ever is it the child's fault. Never ever is it your shame or your guilt. You did not choose that. That did happen to you. 
what you can choose now. And this is such a powerful message that I want everyone to understand. What you can choose is the way you view it today. That is not asking anyone to forgive or forget or to just get over it or, you know, deflect it. Those of us who are very good at surviving are often very good at deflecting and ignoring and just sort of moving on with their life and pretending that doesn't happen, right? There's a lot of trauma responses that can manifest in people's life. And it can be everything from vices and addictions. It can be, so in my case, I am somewhat of a workaholic, but you know what? I've decided that that's a positive trait. <laughs> that being said, there can be different I ways of this type. <laughs> yeah, there, there's different ways that we can sort of cope or deal with life. What's disempowering is when that thing controls you. This is a big differentiator. For example, in my case, I have evaluated my workaholic tendencies and I have established what I refer to as balance in my personal life, which is different for me than most people because I'm not normal and I'm okay with that. That being said, I, as long as I maintain control of the thing, point one, and point two, I choose to allow it. In other words, I have made the decision that working hard and, and being accomplishment oriented is actually can be a positive thing in my life if I use it for a positive thing, right? So point one, I choose it. It has not controlled me or overcome me. And point two, you know, it's a, it's a positive thing that I choose to remain in my life. So there's a big empowerment when you realize you have the ability to be in control. That's a choice, right? That means you can choose to not be overcome by things. You can choose to not let a vice or a trigger or an addiction or whatever the trauma is overcome you and take you down. That doesn't mean it won't make you cry. That doesn't mean it won't trigger you ever. That doesn't mean it may not ever haunt you again. I'm again, I'm, I am being realistic talking about someone who has experienced this, right? Taking your power back is saying you no longer control me. You will not control my mood, the way I see the world, the way I interact with other people. You will not have anything to do with me today. You controlled me back then when I was a powerless child. You do not have that control over me today. And I can sense that power in you. I know you are this fierce woman. I know you would die for your children. I can sense this, right? I know you are that mama bear for them. So when you apply that same protective mechanism to yourself, right? You have the ability now to choose to not be controlled by those perpetrators or that abuse or that trauma or all the things that still haunt you, right? It doesn't mean it's erasing it and, you know, it doesn't mean it's not, it didn't happen. There's a difference in ignoring things and deflecting them and just sort of pretending like they're not there and facing them and saying, you don't control me. That's fun fact. It's, it's one of the reasons I laugh. Mm -hmm. Laughing is a subconscious reaction. This is not something I intend on doing. It just happens. But that being said, it's a subconscious mm -hmm. release. Instead of feeling sad or angry or, or, you know, instead of letting myself get to a negative emotion state, it's a ha. But it's also, I'm not going to give anyone the middle finger on this, but it's also a middle finger to the trauma. It's a middle finger to the trauma and it's saying, you don't affect me. You don't, you don't even, you don't control me. I am not even worried about you. I laugh in your face. So I don't think a lot of people realize that children are the greatest heroes of self-sacrifice because as of adults, we have that cognitive awareness where we're just like, okay, I'm not gonna do, some of us, okay, <laughs> some of us, I'm not gonna do what they did because it turned out really crappy and it caused them pain. So that means it will cause me pain. Children, they look at a situation, they're like, okay, if I hurt, that means the person behind me won't hurt. And they have this heroism that's instilled in them that slowly begins to dwindle um, when they begin into like, when, you, when you're in junior high and high school, you become more self-aware. You're more self-conscious. You know, once you hit that puberty part, you're like, okay, you know, I have an odor kind of thing. But before puberty, you just have this whole bravery, like I'm going to protect the world kind of thing. And people don't realize that when you groom at that stage, um, before puberty, when they get into puberty, um, they're already in that grooming type of mindset that they're actually able to groom other children who are younger because they went through it. First of all, you are here for a reason, not only physically here on this live stream, but physically here on this earth right now for a reason. All of this information that you and I know, most people don't know. They don't get it. And it's kind of annoying, but 
sometimes they need people like us to tell them to their face what we experience so that they can get away from the idea that this is an exaggeration or a theory. Again, kind of wish, you know, we didn't have to do all that, but happy to do it if it means we're going to raise awareness for the sake of protecting other children. So thank you for what you're doing in the world. Thank you for protecting not only your children, but being a light and a strength to these women and these children that you work with. Because of your experience and because of your example, you can help other people prevent themselves and their children from experiencing harm. You can literally change your corner of the world. And that is because, or maybe despite of what you experienced. I realized recently, and this is powerful, I was literally born for this. And the irony is that now I'm working with this nonprofit that literally hunts down and convicts bad guys. If we had the option to go back and change the past, would we choose something different? No. I want everyone to acknowledge how powerful that is because, oh, a lot of, a lot of survivors tell me that. And that's when, you know, like, okay, healing, there's no finish line to healing, right? There's no like one, two, three, and then I'm healed and I'm all better. But when you can acknowledge that, that I feel is like, that is the crux of healing. It happened, but it happened for a reason. And I would not change it if I had the option to girl, that is some power.